Morena Etifano, welcome along to Summit Church Online. It is great to be with you this morning. And how cool was last Sunday uh, having an opportunity to to pause, right, to mm, reflect? So uh, I know as I was, uh, yeah, kind of taking that time to uh, dwell and to listen to the Spirit, uh, it was just such a special time for me and really timely as well. I definitely needed that uh, that time. So I hope uh, you enjoyed it. If you missed. Uh, the service last Sunday, then feel free to head onto our website. You can find it. Uh, make sure you check that out. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I really enjoyed uh, yeah not having a live Sunday for <laughs> in a long time. Very restful, yeah. very relaxing. Great to sleep in. Engage <laughs> yeah, a little bit and to be able to engage alongside you. Um, yeah, it was fantastic. Mm. Hey, if uh, yeah, if you jump in the chat and say hi, that'd be awesome. Say hi to our team there. Uh, whether you're in our um, yeah, church online platform or on YouTube or watching on Facebook, yeah, jump in and say hi. And if you're new to Summit, then head to our website, uh, summitchurch.nz. You'll see a button there. You can click that says connect and uh, send us your details. We'd love to yeah, get to know. Um, we know that there's new people out there connecting in with us and we'd love to, to meet you. Uh, yeah, and so yeah, make sure that you do that. Yeah, we'd love to connect with you. Hey, another cool way to connect uh, for the wahine in our community, uh, we have uh, this event on Sunday night called Embrace. Uh, it's a beautiful event where the women of Summit Church are coming together on Zoom uh, just to encourage one another and just to be in, um, in the presence of God together. Uh, we have a huge, like, awesome opportunity to be hearing stories from the lives of Sarah Rush, from Leah Witherall, and from Stacey McLean, who are just wonderful women in Fantastic. our community. Yeah. I love them all dearly. It's going to be a great event. Yeah, it's going to be so good. So if you haven't registered for that, make sure you do. You can find the event on Facebook, or you can check it out on the website, uh, wherever you wherever you find it. Make sure you register. We'd love to see you there on Sunday. Mm. Yeah. Hey, uh, one of our main characters really through all of our online series, sermons, services, all the things we've been doing has been a little ceramic friend, uh, Rona, named Rona. after a certain virus, uh, <laughs> our little ceramic Rhino friend. And, you know, uh, many of you are aware of this. Uh, some of you will be blissfully unaware. Um, but, you know, we have some fun with Rona from time to time. Uh, and sometimes... Uh, if people stick around on the stream, there's some in credit stuff that goes on. A couple of weeks ago, we put out a bit of a challenge to, to people do something creative, uh, reflecting on Rona's contribution. And so a couple of our families uh, got together and have put together this little tribute to our online friend, Rona. Check it out. Homegrown Sunday service. 10 a.m. Got to find our Rona. Got to find our Rona. Something's changed in the atmosphere. Architecture. Unfamiliar. I'm getting used to this. Time flies slow in this lockdown life. Stick around. You'll see what I mean. But there's a ceramic face that I'm dreaming of after church. I'm taking her with me. Rona's riding shotgun underneath the hot sun, feeling like a someone. Rona's riding shotgun underneath the hot sun, can't hear a thing cause ears numb. Shotgun, hot sun, Rona, ooh, yeah, yeah. She's on a Sunday, she's Rona, she's hiding from you, Rona, Rona. Mm, yeah. Man, how cool was that video? I loved seeing the little kids so riding fun. past with their bikes and celebrating um, our favorite friend, Rona. She really steals the show, doesn't she? Um, in her, all of her splendor, so. <laughs> and without words too. Yeah, yeah. What, yeah. what a rhino, we love her. <laughs> hey, if you are a part of our Summit Kids program or if you are in exchange, um, we love you guys. We can't wait to one day be back uh, together in person. Mm -hmm. But today you've got awesome programs happening, so why don't you guys head out there now, connect in with the different, uh, the different programs and check that out. Mm. 
Mm. Yeah, have an amazing time. Mm. And we're going to carry on here with our Called Beyond series. Uh, Braid's continuing uh, for us this morning uh, in Acts 26. So thanks, Braid. Kia ora, Summit. It's great to be with you again as we jump back into our Called Beyond series in the book of Acts. Series we've been journeying through for most of this year. And today we come to Acts chapter 26. We just have three more weeks in this series to finish the last three chapters of this amazing book. So if you've got a Bible with you, got your, your phone there with the Bible app on it, I'd love you to come with me to Acts 26 if you would. On August 28th, 1963, the Reverend Martin Luther King stood on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C., and he delivered an electrifying address that's gone down in history as one of the greatest speeches of all time. He was actually just one of a series of speakers that day, talking to hundreds of thousands of people who'd marched for civil rights on Washington, D.C. But it was his speech that electrified a nation and has gone down in history. We know the speech by the echo, the, the line that he continued to repeat through, uh, through it. I have a dream. And the fascinating thing is that the parts of the speech that we know best were actually the part where he departed from his notes and just ad-libbed this vision, this dream of what he hoped America would be one day in the area of civil rights. He said, I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners would sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream, he said, that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream. And that speech has gone down in history as the high watermark of Dr. King's entire career. As well as a civil rights leader, he was, of course, a pastor and a preacher. And so in his lifetime, he delivered hundreds, if not thousands, of sermons and speeches. But it's this speech that he's remembered for. As we come then to Acts 26, we come to a speech that the Apostle Paul makes. If you remember a couple of weeks back, he has been on trial in front of Governor Felix and now a new governor called Porcius Festus. And uh, it's not gone well. And so Paul appealed his case to the emperor in Rome. But a few days later, one of the Herods, King Herod Agrippa II, with his sister Bernice, has come to visit the new governor, Festus. And so Paul is called in before Festus and Agrippa and a crowded room to explain a little bit and defend a little bit his faith in Jesus. And the speech that he gives, which is the content of Acts 26, is considered by many scholars to be Paul's equivalent of the I have a dream speech. This is the way one eminent New Testament scholar, Dr. Ben Witherington, puts it. He says this chapter is the climax of all Paul's speeches in Acts. The speech is perhaps the most elegant of all, reflect, reflecting careful preparation and attention to elements of style. Paul has had time to reflect and prepare a rhetorically persuasive piece. You see, the ancient world had this idea of rhetoric, how you did a speech. It was, it was some rules around oratory. And the highest form of speech making was called the apologia. And what Dr. Witherington and others have shown in their in-depth commentaries of Acts is that Paul's speech here in Acts 26 follows all the rules of ancient literature, sorry, ancient rhetoric. It follows the categories of oratory exactly, and what is called an apologia. And in fact, that's confirmed by a tiny little detail that Luke throws into the story here in Acts 26. So you read in Acts 26 verse 1, Then Agrippa said to Paul, You have permission to speak for yourself. Remember, Agrippa and Festus are in this full room listening to Paul's defense. And then Luke tells us this in verse 1, So Paul motioned with his hand and began his defense. And that little detail that he motioned with his hand and began his defense is part of this idea of, of rhetoric, of great oratory, of someone who is following the rules uh, that the ancient Greeks and Romans had for the highest form of speech making. Now, for someone like me that does sermons for a living, I'm a professional speaker, if you like, uh, this is fascinating stuff. 
but I understand that most of you don't enjoy public speaking and you don't speak that often and, and the times you do you'd rather not. And so I don't want to attack Acts 26 today from a speech making point of view. That's what Dr. Witherington and a number of other scholars do. They walk through Acts 26 showing how carefully crafted this apologia is. But the fact is that, that most of you listening to this aren't interested in how to do a speech according to the ancient rules of Greek rhetoric. Instead, what I want to show us is the two simple things that Paul does here that every single one of us can do, whether in a speech or sermon, or whether across the coffee table or a lounge with a friend. You see, this idea of an apologia, a, a defense or an argument for what we believe, is actually found in the Bible. In fact, there's very no well-known well verse in 1 Peter chapter 3. Always be prepared to give an answer, that's the word, an apologia, to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, Peter says. But he adds, and do this with gentleness and respect, as we've unpacked in these last few weeks in this series. Paul, uh, sorry, Peter here is not asking that every single follower of Jesus uh, be someone who can give a persuasive speech, someone who can deliver uh, a piece of oratory that fulfills all the, the ancient rules of rhetoric. What Peter's simply calling for is for us to be able to make an apology, to, to give an explanation to anyone who asks us why we believe in Jesus. And that may not be speaking up front in front of a crowd of people for most of us. It may be sitting in our lounge at home chatting with a friend. It may be sitting in, in a cubicle in the office. It may be having a coffee with a mate and simply talking when they ask us about our faith in Jesus. And so I want to think of, look at Paul's speech today in those kinds of terms. What does it look like for us to be prepared to give an answer for the hope that we have? And I simply want to highlight two key things that Paul does in Acts 26 that I think every one of us can learn to do really well. The first thing is this. Paul utilized the power of story. Paul utilized the power of story. See, the whole speech that he gives is essentially telling his story. And any of us are able to do that. In my library, I have a beautiful book that was written many years ago, actually, by Billy Graham's brother-in-law, a man by the name of Leighton Ford. He too was an evangelist. And he wrote this book called The Power of Story. Here's what he said. Each of us has a story, what I call a story with a small s, the story of our own lives. At some point, Ford says, in our journey through life, our story collides with the story of God, the story with a large S. God's story calls our story into question. And I love this idea. I love this, this concept that if you're a follower of Jesus, you have a story because your story of your life, small s, at some point collided, and I love that word, collided with the big capital S story of God that centers on the person and the work of Jesus. And because of that, your life and my life have never been the same. And it was the same for Paul. And what Acts 26 really is, as well as being this brilliantly crafted speech, it's actually simply Paul's story. And so he utilized the power of story in a way that you and I can do as well. Now, we're not going to read the whole chapter. We don't have time to do that in this message. But essentially, Paul's speech breaks into two halves because that's how his story does. It's the before and after. So in verses 5 through to 11, Paul talks about um, what his life was like before Jesus collided with him. He talks about his upbringing and his training as a Pharisee in the first few verses in Jerusalem. And then he talks about his opposition to the followers of Jesus and his persecution of them. And then, of course, comes the dramatic moment that he speaks about in verses 12 and 13. He says, on one of those journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. About noon, King Agrippa, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun blazing around me and my companions. And as he goes on, as we'll see shortly, he talks about the fact that Jesus speaks to him, appears to him. 
and that introduces the after of his life. This appearance of Jesus when he not only converts Paul to faith in him, but calls him as an apostle and an eyewitness to him. And Paul's story finishes with his obedience to this call of Jesus. And so this is what's fascinating. Paul, in this amazing speech, this eloquent speech that he makes, is actually just telling his story. And this idea of a before and an after is not, was not just true of Paul. That's true of every single one of us. All of us have a story that has a before and an after. And the dividing line between them is when our story collided with the story of Jesus. You see this brilliantly, by the way, in verse 18. This is where Paul is talking about Jesus talking to him. I'm going to start reading from verse 17 for context. This is Jesus speaking. I will rescue you, Paul, from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. And so what Paul is saying is that as Jesus called him to this ministry as an apostle, he called him to, to preach the message, to declare and share the message in the person of Jesus with everyone so that their eyes would be opened and so that every person who trusts in Jesus could have a before and after. And this is what verse 18 is saying if you look at it carefully. If, if you've trusted in Jesus, you've gone from darkness to light from the power of Satan to the power of God, from implied guilt and shame to forgiveness, from alienation and aloneness to belonging. You see, this is our story, every single one of us who have trusted in Jesus. In fact, what's fascinating is that if you look at these words in the after column, we've been moved to light and to the power of God, the kingdom of God, forgiveness and belonging. It's very much like a passage in Colossians chapter 1. Now, there's some debate over when that letter was actually written, but I believe Paul wrote it from Rome when he gets in Acts 28. So I think in just a few months after giving this speech, he sat down and he dictated the letter that we call Colossians. And here's what he says in Colossians 1. Giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people. That's belonging. In the kingdom of light. For he's rescued us from the dominion of darkness. He's brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves and whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. See, this is our story. Every single one of us. It's not just Paul who had a before and after. It's me and it's you. And as Paul seeks to make an apology, a defense, just give an explanation for, for the faith that he has in Jesus, for the hope that he holds on to, Paul utilized the incredible power of story. And you and I can do exactly the same thing. So let me ask you a question here. What difference has Jesus made to your life? See, I think part of being prepared in the way that, that Peter calls us to in his epistle, 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, prepared to give a reason, to give an apologia for the hope that we have. Part of that is being uh, aware of the difference that Jesus has made and being prepared to share our story. And that doesn't need to be big. It may just be a few sentences. But what's our before and what's our after? And what difference has Jesus made when his story collided with our story? See, Leighton Ford's right. Each of us has a story. You have a story, and one of the most powerful ways that you can talk about your faith in Jesus is simply to share your story with someone else. And so if you've never done it before, I would encourage you to actually think about how would I share my story in just a few sentences with someone else. It doesn't have to be huge, but what's your before and what's your after? See, for me, the difference that Jesus made is through the whole concept of grace. I grew up, as you know, in a church family, parents who loved Jesus. So I was raised to, with this understanding of who Jesus was. I placed my faith in him as a child and recommitted my life at different times through the years. But it was a, as a young adult that I, I came, uh, collided with really the doctrine of grace. 
See, for me, I'd grown up as this church kid who always did the right thing and was always well behaved well, most of the time. And I was just a good kid. And that's what I thought God wanted from me. And so for me, a relationship with God was based on my own goodness and my own behavior. And so I would fluctuate in my life between uh, trying hard to be good so that when I was good and when I was feeling like I was measuring up to what God wanted, I'd become arrogant and I'd look down on people who weren't as good as me. But then when I fell into sin or made a mistake, I would swing like a pendulum over to this, this deep sadness that I, I was a failure and I wasn't sure that God loved me. And this was my walk with God for a number of years through my teenage years until as a young adult, I discovered this idea of grace, that my relationship with God, God's love for me is never based on my performance, on what I do, on whether I'm good enough because I'm not good enough. Instead, his love for me, my relationship with him, is based purely on Jesus' performance, not mine. On Jesus' goodness, not mine. And when I discovered that, my relationship with God radically changed. That's the difference he's made in my life. What about you? What difference has Jesus made in you? What's the before for you and what's the after? Because everyone has a story. And that can be one of the most powerful ways you can talk to others about Jesus. Paul utilized the power of story. The second thing I want to highlight here and, and pull out from, from Acts 26 is that this is not, not only how Paul uh, spoke, but the content of what Paul spoke. He highlighted the power of the resurrection. So he utilized the power of story and he highlighted the power of the resurrection. See, this was, this was key for Paul. Jesus was alive, and this is what made all the difference in the world. If you've got Acts 26 there in front of you, have a look at just a few excerpts I want to pull out here. Look at verse 6, for example. Now, Paul says, It is because of my hope in what God has promised our ancestors that I'm on trial today. This is the promise our 12 tribes are hoping to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God day and night. King Agrippa, it is because of this hope that these Jews are accusing me. He's, notice, he's mentioned hope or promise four or five times. What is this hope or promise? Verse 8, Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? See, what Paul is saying is that this is the hope that, that generations of Jewish people have looked forward to, the promise that one day, God would ra raise back to life the righteous and they would live in the eternal kingdom ruled by the Messiah forever and ever. This was the hope. And this has been fulfilled in Jesus. We'll come to verse 14, where Paul is describing this collision that he had with Jesus on the road to Damascus. Verse 14 says, We all fell to the ground and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It's hard to kick against the goads, which is the prodding stick that people would use. And then I asked, Paul says, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. See, Paul saw and heard the resurrected Jesus. Or go to verse 22. God has helped me to this very day, so I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses, the Old Testament, said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer and as the first to rise from the dead would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. You notice what Paul's doing. Paul is going after the reality that Jesus' tomb was empty because Jesus had risen again. And it's not only Paul. It's actually the emphasis that Luke himself has shown all the way through the book of Acts. Listen to these words from UK pastor Phil Moore. He says, Luke goes out of his way to model for us gospel messages that focus at least as much on the resurrection as they do on the cross. See, we tend to think that the cross, the death of Jesus is the center of the gospel, but actually it's the cross and the resurrection. It's the cross and the empty tomb. Without the resurrection, Jesus' death didn't accomplish anything. Luke only uses the word cross three times in Acts, Fillmore says, but he uses the word resurrection 11 times. He only speaks of Jesus being crucified nine times, but speaks of him being raised to life 16 times. 
And this is the emphasis not only of Luke, but all the way through the New Testament. If you think about the letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians just a few years before Acts 26, he said, now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received and on which you've taken your stand. For what I received, I passed on to you and you received it as of first importance. This is it, Paul says. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Paul says that's the gospel. And then he enlarges on the resurrection. And then Jesus appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, and then to the 12, and then 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. And then he appeared to James, his brother, and then to all the apostles. And then last of all, Paul says he appeared to me also as one abnormally born. Why the, this emphasis? Because for Paul, the resurrection is at the heart of this entire good news we have about Jesus. In fact, he'll go on to say a few verses later, if there is no resurrection of the dead in the future, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. In fact, what Paul does then is he then in 1 Corinthians 15 goes through these bunch of statements showing how critical the resurrection of Jesus is to what we believe. If Jesus hasn't been raised, there is no Christian faith. If Jesus hasn't been raised, the Bible is a bunch of lies. If Jesus hasn't been raised, there is no forgiveness of sins. His death never accomplished a thing without the resurrection. If Jesus hasn't been raised, there is no eternal life. There's no afterlife. There's no heaven. Just forget it. We die and that's it. And if Jesus hasn't been raised, then every Christian who chooses to follow him is a complete fool and idiot. And then Paul says in verse 20, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, Adam, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all who trust in him will be made alive. That's why theologians Josh and, and Sean McDowell say these words, the historical faith of the resurrection is the very foundation for the Christian life. This is not an optional article of faith. It is the faith. The resurrection of Jesus Christ and Christianity stand or fall together. One cannot be true without the other. And that's why Paul, as he stands before these people and makes possibly the most important speech of his life, he not only utilized the power of story, he highlighted the power of the resurrection. We believe in a risen Lord and Savior. And that's what we have to share. So let me ask you then the second question. What difference has the resurrection of Jesus made to your life? See, for me, it's made all the difference in the world. As a teenager in my late teens, having been raised in the church and raised in this whole, you know, world of, of faith in Jesus and, you know, Bible stories and everything, I came to a, a moment in my life in my late teens where I really began to question whether or not this faith that had been handed to me by my parents was true. And I didn't go through a rebellious stage. I simply went through a stage where I wanted to know for sure, did I believe this was true or not? Not based on what mum and dad believed, but what on I believed. And I've shared this before, but I ended up realizing, based on what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, that the whole Christian faith hangs on one thread, the resurrection of Jesus. If Jesus doesn't rise, it's all garbage. If Jesus rose from the dead, it's all true. And so I set out to investigate, did I believe that Jesus rose from the dead? And I ended up being absolutely convinced by the evidence historically, Jesus is risen. His tomb was empty, and that's why I'm a Christian today, because I, I unequivocally believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, and that's a key part of my story and how the big story of God in Jesus collided with me. What about you? Are you convinced of the resurrection of Jesus? Because I tell you what, if we understand the power of our story and the impact Jesus has made in our life, and we realize the importance of his resurrection and this wonderful good news, then we are ready to share the difference that the risen Jesus has made in our life. 
And that's what I think Paul's example in Acts 26 is teaching us, that we need to be ready to share the difference that the risen Jesus has made in our lives. See, that's what Peter was calling for. That's what Peter is asking every single follower of Jesus to do. We don't all preach sermons. We may you may never make a speech in your life. You may be the quietest, most introverted, shyest person who's ever followed Jesus in the world. But you can still give an answer to someone sitting across the table with a friend about why you believe in Jesus. You can still share the difference and the power in your story of what Jesus has done in you. And you can talk about the difference that it's made to you to know that Jesus is risen from the dead. And this is the call on each of our lives, folks, to be ready to share the difference that the risen Jesus has made in our lives. And here's the freeing thing. And I talked about this earlier in the series back in May, but I want to come back to this again. God's call on our lives is to share the story of how God's big story has collided with our story. God's call on us is to be ready to share the difference that the risen Jesus has made in our lives. It's not to convert people. It's not to convince people. God doesn't expect you and me to have all of the arguments figured out and to have every answer ready that could ever be asked about evolution and dinosaurs and the reliability of the scripture and the historicity of Jesus. No, no. He's asking us to be ready to share the difference Jesus has made in our lives. Because whether or not someone chooses to trust in Jesus is not up to you and me. That's the work of the Spirit of God in their lives. Back in, uh, in May, when I talked about this a little bit in this series, I shared what I still think is the best definition of evangelism ever done. Bill Bright, the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ. Success in witnessing, he said, is simply taking the initiative to share Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit and leaving the results to God. See, and that's what Paul does. Look at the closing verses of Acts 26. He's made his speech. He gets to verse 23, talking about the resurrection from the dead. Verse 24. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You're out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning has driven you insane. I am not insane, most excellent Festus, Paul replied. What I'm saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. I'm convinced none of this has escaped his notice. It wasn't done in a corner. This is historical fact, Paul says. Verse 27, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? Do you believe the Old Testament? I know you do. And then Agrippa said to Paul, do you think that in such a short time you could persuade me to become a Christian? And Paul replies in verse 29, short time or long, I pray to God that not only you, but all of those listening to me today may become what I am except for these chains. You see, Paul delivers one of the greatest speeches ever about Jesus. And Governor Festus scoffs. And King Agrippa sidesteps. There's no evidence that either of those men ever trusted in Jesus. But that wasn't Paul's job. Paul's job was simply to take the initiative to share Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit and leave the results to God. Your job is not to convince your friends or family members or workmates that, that they have to trust in Jesus. Your job is not to change their hearts. Your job is not to answer, be able to answer every single question or problem they raise. What each of us are simply called to do is share the difference that the risen Jesus has made in our lives. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have a before and you have an after. The story of God has collided with your story. And you've got a story to share about the risen Jesus. Let's go share that message today. God bless, guys. Thanks so much, Brad. I yeah. uh, really appreciate you uh, opening God's word for us this morning uh, yeah. and leading us through uh, Acts 26 and reminding us with that uh, incredible challenge really to to be ready to you know to share our faith mm -hmm. um to uh and from our own perspective you know to to share that uh the difference that the risen jesus has made in our own lives yeah. with people yeah. um and that's where we can start you know from our own stories and so yeah thanks for that that challenge and that and that reminder 
uh, may that motivate us uh, to, to find opportunities to do that this week uh, and in and in coming weeks and in all of our lives mm. hey we're going to worship together now our team is going to lead us in a beautiful song called there is a king uh, that just paints a beautiful picture mm. of uh, of the risen jesus who reigns as our king and just reminds us of this future incredible future hope that yeah. we have of just being able to to bask in his glory and be in his presence wow. so yeah let's worship now
team for leading us in such a, a powerful song. Mm. Hey, mm-hmm. I really love that song and those lyrics that just speak of our glorious King. Um, you, can't, you can't help but be moved by some of those uh, by some of those lyrics. Hey, it's mm. such a good just song. Beautiful yeah. lyrics. Yeah. Hey, listen to this. It's from Isaiah uh, twenty-five, uh, starting in verse eight. It says this. Uh, He, this is God, he will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. Mm -hmm. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day, they will say, surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Mm -hmm. So as we go out into this week, let us remember this to rejoice in the salvation that we have in Jesus and to share that uh, so confidently knowing that he goes before us and he goes with us Um, so yeah would you have a a wonderful week it's been great to be with you this morning
just one touch from the Savior. 